tonight that God is wanting you to just, we have been so, I feel like we have been, as a state and as a people, this week that we have been like almost taking a beating. And I feel like tonight that we just need to just say, you know, we are not defeated, that we are not beat down, that all these things that have been going on with, you know, all the disasters and everything that is going on, we are not beat down, but that our praise is a weapon, that our praise is a weapon, and we need to show the devil that we are not going to be defeated, that we are resilient, and that we are strong in the Lord. And so I just want us to sing this tonight, say, my dance is a weapon. Let's just worship him tonight. Hallelujah. I didn't know that I was going to be playing keyboard tonight, but let's just, let's just worship him tonight. And as I was saying, you know, all the things that have been going on this week, and I know a lot of people are really going through some, some really tough times, and this, one, this song, this is Holy Spirit, this is there's nothing, there's nothing worth more. There's nothing that can compare because 
God is our living hope. He is our living hope. He is the one that we love. And even in times of heartbreak and even when we're going through stuff, we need to remember that, that no matter what, that we could come into his presence and he can heal and he can he can just, you know, come and wrap his arms around us and just love on us. And so tonight I want us just to worship him and just just let him just I can't get over that and I know I need to be quiet. Just I just want you to tonight just to worship him. Let's just raise our hands. And let's just focus solely on Him because He is the one who holds everything, everything in His hands. And He holds us in His hands. And oh, I just thank You, Lord, because You are worthy, God. And I just exalt You tonight, oh God, for You are worthy, Jesus. tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is Tasted 
Give him a hand clap of praise tonight. Come on. If you can't feel him in this house tonight, you're frozen. He is here and he is moving and he is touching. Can we give him a shout tonight? Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Such a sweet presence in here tonight. A sweet presence. Pastor asked me if I would minister tonight in his absence, and uh, we need to keep him in, in our prayers. Um, I get I have an app on my phone that uh, it's called I 24 It's it's, a, it's a Israeli news, and I get messages all day, every day, where they're firing missiles into Israel. And uh, I would say that the, they're not near those, but I would still say we still need to pray for them. I want to thank Pastor for asking me to minister tonight. It, it, it's hard to move on after a move of the Spirit like that. Didn't they do a great job tonight? You did. You did a great job. I want to thank Pastor for asking me to minister tonight. I want to thank every minister in this house for the job that you do. Every teacher. I want to give a shout out to the media booth because I did that job in this church for six years and it goes unnoticed a lot of times. But I tell you what, they do a great job up there. And security for the protection that they give us, thank you. I've got a message for you tonight. 
know, about seven years ago, I guess it has been now, uh, TH said he needed somebody to take over the early service because the person who was doing it was stepping down. And uh, I said, you don't need to find somebody. I said, I'll do it. And uh, Sister April joined in. And uh, it's been joyous. It's been a battle. It's been a challenge. But we have church at 815 on Sunday morning. Sister Becky is part of it. She's a tremendous part of it. Brother Roger comes and helps sometimes. Uh, we have some there that uh, don't come to this service. Uh, the, the only service they come to is the 815, and that's Wes and Terry Teeter, and we need to remember her tonight in our prayers because she had knee surgery yesterday. And from what I heard, she's in a lot of pain. Um, Della and Robbie and their children, they're an integral part of the 815 service. As is Brother Darren and Sister Selena. They're not here tonight. The baby is sick with the flu. But when I took that over, I made a Facebook page. Some of you are on it and some of you know it. it it's called Early Riser. And uh, because to get there at 8.15 in the morning, you have to be an early riser. I'm in there some mornings at 7 o'clock. Sister April's there at 7, 7.30, getting ready for God's work. It's hard sometimes because on that service, we have to be done and completed by 9.30 because the bearded wonder comes in with his Sunday school class. And he is gracious sometimes because uh, how many know preachers sometimes can get long-winded? And uh, I have gone over, uh, some of the other ministers have gone over, um, and Charlie graciously just goes on and waits and bides his time. I gave a message Sunday morning, and God wouldn't let me turn loose of it. So when I do that, and he doesn't let me turn loose of it, I take it that he wants me to give it and hear it. So if you were at the 815 Sunday morning, this is kind of a continuation, so don't get up and leave because there's a whole lot more. I'm, I'm t very time restricted over there because we have to be done early for Sunday school classes. But in here, hey, we got all night. <laughs> so, if everybody will stand tonight in the house of God, that's our, our tradition, and it's the way we honor the word of God, is to stand in the presence when it is read. The title of my message tonight is, How Far is the Altar? Now, do you really know what an altar is? It, 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 let me give you a... Uh, dictionary description here. It says an altar is a raised area in the house of worship where people can honor God with offerings. It is prominent in the Bible as God's table, a sacred place for the sacrifices and gifts offered up to God. The word altar comes from a Latin word meaning high, also another one to, that means to ritually burn or sacrifice, which suggests its early uh, purpose as detailed in the Bible. The word tonight, we're going to 2 Kings 21 and 1. It says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hesbazibah. I'm going to butcher these names, so bear with me. And he did that which, which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places, which Hezekiah his father had destroyed. And he reared up all altars for Baal, and made a grove, as did Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, your blessings this day have been tremendous and without number. Lord, I thank you for each and every one. I thank you for the, for the opportunity to stand behind this sacred desk tonight. Lord, we give you glory and we give you honor. And at this time, Lord, I ask for your touch, your anointing, Lord, Lord to, to preach, to, to teach, to deliver the word that you have given me. Lord, and I also ask for your anointing to be resting on each and every person that hears my voice tonight, Lord. 
open their ears, their eyes, and their hearts to receive of your word. And it's in the blessed, holy name of Jesus that we pray these things. And the church said amen. Can we give him one more hand clap of praise tonight before we get started? Manasseh ruled Judah for 55 years. That was longer than any king of Judah. If we rely on the prophetic portions of the Bible alone, the portrait is painted of this man is evil. That's just the, simply the only way you can put it. He was a mass murderer, an idol worshiper, whose reign was so tainted it would later be the cause of the Babylonian destruction of Jubal, Ju Jerusalem and the temple in 586 B.C. Manasseh promoted idolatry throughout his kingdom. He built pagan temples. He sacrificed one of his sons to one of these false gods. There's an old tradition in Judaism that Manasseh executed the prophet Isaiah. God spoke to Manasseh and the people, but they did not listen. So God sent the Assyrians to attack Judah. When Manasseh was captured by the Assyrians and brought to Babylon, he called out to God. God had grace on Manasseh and returned him to Jerusalem. In response, Manasseh removed the foreign gods and the idols from the temple and restored the altar of the Lord there. But I want you to, to, to listen to the first part. All the things that he did. The first thing that he did. I mean, come on. Who would put a 12-year-old in charge of a whole country? Do we have any 12-year-olds here tonight? Hey, hey, we got two. Can you imagine these two young men being in charge of the United States? They would probably love it. White House would be filled with candy and ice cream. So, you know. But a 12-year-old does not have the maturity to rule over a nation. Not especially in these days and times. So he made bad decisions. He tore down the altars of God. And he started idol worship. Okay, we, we, can, we can say, well, you know, that was Jerusalem and stuff like that. Let's break it down. Let's break it home. The Christian religion is struggling to be able to hold on to our beliefs and values. We have been told that we have to do this and we have to do that uh, by, by government forces in times past. Uh, with threat of losing our tax-exempt status, then that's fine if they want it. You know, I don't have one. <laughs> so if they want mine, they'd have a hard time getting it. But on that note, we sit back and we allow them to pass laws that we should not let them pass because we stay quiet and we don't say anything. We have seen laws passed in times... Uh, just in the last 10 years or so that changed the course of a lot of things for the United States to where there was, a, I, I remember a few years back, there was a woman in Kentucky who lost her job. And I think, I could be mistaken, but I think she went to jail because she would not sell a marriage license. She was a court clerk. And she would not sell a marriage license to two men who were getting married. So she lost her job. We have been asked to bow and bend and, and shape our beliefs to the world beliefs, and we can't do that because, I mean, really, that's idol worship because we're, we're, we're not worshiping the, the true God. We're not going by his word. We're not doing what he says. We're doing what the world says. We're conforming to them instead of them conforming to us, and we're supposed to be trying to get them to look at things our way and to bend to the will of God. As of yet, I don't know of no leaders in our country that have sacrificed their sons to a false god, but we have seen a lot of things that have happened and transpired just in the last 10 years that should not have. We, we have people who stand up and, and you can't say anything against them, and, and it's not that we're haters, it's just that we want to be able to tell them God cares. 
God loves you. God wants to give you a place for all eternity. But all he asks of you is to do what the word says. Homosexuality, according to the word of God, is a sin. Lesbianism, according to the word of God, is a sin. This transgender stuff, according to the word of God, is a sin. And I will stand on the word of God, and I will proclaim it until the day I die. Sin is sin, and that's all it is. Yeah, give him a hand clap. We wonder why we struggle and why we have such a hard time even in the Christian church. Move it down just a little bit more even in the church of God. We hear about, in times past, all the things that used to take place in this wonderful denomination, Pentecost, Pentecostal, full gospel. We believe in everything the Bible says, the gifts of the Spirit. And we we hear about in the days of old when the church first started, how they used to gather around the pot belly stoves and they could be so much in the Spirit that they could wrap their arms around a red-hot stove and not be burned. And how when they would, the sisters would shake their head, the bobby bobby pins would fly. And, you know, it's, we don't see that anymore. Why? We got away from the altar. We got away from it. We moved on and we think that we don't, that we know more than what we should. And it's just so sad And I've heard Pastor T.H. say it so many times. The church of God used to pray and fast, but now we just pray real fast because nobody lingers at the altars anymore. When somebody needs to be saved, they used to to just gather and pray and pray and pray and for hours at a time. And I can remember back in the 80s at the church of God in Russellville that they would sit there till 12 and 1 o'clock in the morning praying. And we've gotten away from that. We've gotten away from seeking the face of God. We've gotten away, even in our homes, and it doesn't have to be here. It's in our homes also that we have gotten away from doing what we're supposed to do. How far is that altar from your heart? Where did you leave it? Where did we leave it? And I stand here just as guilty as anybody else. Where did we leave the altar at? It's sad. All God wants from us is our obedience to Him when He asks that we have fellowship with Him, talk with Him, pray to Him. I mean, on a daily basis. Paul said to always be in an attitude of prayer. That's what we're supposed to do. And there's just, in the modern day church, I'm sorry, but there's just not enough of it. 2 Kings 21 and 19. Amon was 20 and 2 years old when he began to reign. A little bit older than his father. And he reigned two years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was that word right there. I'm not going to try it. The daughter of Heroz and Jotba. And he did that which was evil. Oh, here we go again. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh did. Evil. How do you do evil in the sight of the Lord? You do things that are not in his word. You have affairs. You have relationships without the benefit of marriage. You drink. You do drugs. You would rather watch TV than pray. That's evil in the sight of the Lord. You would rather do anything that there is other than spend time with God. That's evil in the sight of God. We, as a modern day church, knowing that the return of Jesus Christ is soon to come, we need to be spending more time in prayer, more time at the altar than we ever have in our entire lives. His time is soon. If he was to come right now, In the next 60 seconds, could we honestly and truly say, I'm ready to go? Have we spent the time with him today that we needed to spend with him? 
Have we spent the time today just giving him praise, just giving him worship, giving him the glory that he deserves? Or were we too wrapped up in everything that was going on? I'll admit it. I stand here as guilty as anybody else. I believe sometimes when a preacher gets up and preaches a message, a lot of times he's preaching about himself. Not all the time, but sometimes. And tonight I stand guilty. We need, as the body of Christ, to be seeking him daily, multiple times. Daniel prayed three times a day. Made time for it. Made time for it. And he was in Babylonian captivity. He was a prisoner of another country. But he made time to God. Did it, how many of us prayed three times today? Slip my hand out high. <laughs> You're the little one in the back. Raise your hand. We need to spend the time that God requires of us with him. We, 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 want, we want to see miracles of God in the church. We need to spend the time with him to find those miracles. If we want to see him move like he has in times past, and I believe he will again, but we've got to open our hearts to him and find him and move upon his word. Go ahead. Don't wait for me. <laughs> we have within us the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said that we would do far greater things than he did. What are we doing? We're spinning our wheels and wasting our time. Second Kings 21, 21 says, Amon, he walked in the way that his father walked in and served idols that his father served, and he worshiped them. What do we teach our children? We teach them, they, they learn by example. They see us do something, they're going to do it. If they see us sitting around watching TV all the time and not, not having a spiritual life of any kind, then that's what they're going to have. If they see us talking about people, that's what they're going to do. If they see us worshiping things like the television set, or, or the automobile, or, or something else that we shouldn't be spending our time with, that's what they're going to do. And it's not good. And we will answer for that. We will answer for that. Second Kings 21 and 22, and it says, And he forsook the Lord God of his fathers, and walked not in the way of the Lord. He was an evil king, the son of Manasseh, and the father of Josiah. Amon was 22 when he began to rule and was king for only two years. I guess the people had enough. He got assassinated. They couldn't take it anymore. The Bible has harsh words for this king. Second Chronicles says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord as his father Manasseh had done. But unlike his father Manasseh, he did not humble himself before the Lord. He stayed evil until he died. Amon had a son who ruled after his assassination. His name was Josiah. He was eight when he took the throne. Eight years old. Eight years old. Now, his father, he had seen nothing godly from him. Neither he, had he seen anything godly from his grandfather. All he saw was Israel worshiping idols. All he saw was evil all over the place. When he had ruled 18 years, he started repairing the temple. During the repair, repair process, they found the book of the law that had been lost. How many know that in those days, scriptures were not that handy? How many ever have a, have a Bible, 
phone, an iPad, the written word, whatever it may be. The Bible is prevalent in this day and time. Old Testament, New Testament. The book of the law had been lost within the temple for years and years and years at this point. And they found it. When the book of the law was read to the king, the words pierced his heart. How many have ever witnessed to somebody and given them the word of God and seen tears come to their eyes when they realized what they had done wrong in their life and that their life was just being lived in sin and if that God had come back at that particular moment, they would spend eternity in hell? When the book of the law was read to the king, Josiah, the words pierced his heart. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, he rent his clothes, he tore them, he, he, he couldn't stand it. It was just tearing him up inside because the words pierced him like a knife. They cut into his very soul and made him realize what he had been doing wrong and the sin that he was living in and the sin that had come before him. The word of God is like a two-edged sword. Scripture says so. We teach in Sunday school, in my class, that when you witness to somebody, you have to do it with the law of God because it exposes the sin in their life, and it's true. The Word of God shuts the mouth. Scripture says so. Look it up. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Hilkiah the son of Shaphan and Akbar the son of Micaiah and Shaphan the scribe and Isaiah the servant of the king saying, Go ye inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found concerning the word of God. Inquire of these words. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us before the, because our fathers had not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest and Ahiakim and Akbar and Shaphan and Isaiah went up to Hulda the prophetess. Notice that word, a prophetess. Anybody want to say that women should not be preachers? It's right here in Scripture. The wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, the son of Haras, the keeper of the wardrobe. And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me, tell Josiah what God has to say. Thus saith the Lord, I, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read. Because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands, therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus saith to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thy heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou hearest what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes. Because, because this upset you, because this troubled you, because this awoke a spirit within you that needed to be awakened in this country a long time ago. And you have wept before me. When was the last time you wept before the Lord? Any one of us. When was the last time we cried tears before God to ask him to move in, in a certain situation? I have also heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king the word again.
Israel turned continuously. You can read it all through the Old Testament. Israel turned their back over and over against God and, and, and went seeking after other things and false gods and worshipped idols that they should not have worshipped, and God would punish them for it. But eventually they would turn back. They would see the error of their ways. Josiah saw the error. The word of God pierced his heart. The word of God can pierce our hearts. How far is the altar? I'm not talking about this. Abraham built an altar out of rocks to sacrifice his son Isaac on the side of a mountain. You can have an altar any place in your house. You can kneel down beside the bed. You can have an altar behind the steering wheel of a car. You can have an altar anywhere that your heart desires. All you have to do is bend your heart to the King of Kings. We have, we have to get back to the basics. We don't need no more committees. We don't need no more new ideas. The old ideas are just fine. We just need to follow the word. That's all we need to do. The altar in the house of worship is a wonderful place, but it doesn't have to be there. One, one of the best movies I ever saw is a fictional movie. It's called War Room. How many of you ever saw it? Great movie. Old woman had a closet that she went into and shut the door. I think we all need to find a closet somewhere. I think we all need to find that altar. We, all, we need to find that place where, where we can touch God, to where we can call out his name, to where he will hear us and he will answer our prayers and he will touch us the way he used to touch the church. We need this so desperately. Everybody's standing in God's house tonight. If they'll come back to the music. In the temple in Jerusalem, there was an altar for both incense and other offerings. It was beautiful. With the sacrificial death of Christ, these ritual sacrifices have lost their meanings because he was the perfect sacrifice. He was the perfect lamb. No other sacrifice could supersede what he had done. The only son of God who gave his life for a people that tried to kill him. The modern day altar, that's where a lost person meets Jesus. That's where people seek God and they get healed. That's where needs are met at the altar. God said, wherever you called out his name, he'd be there. He also said, wherever two or more are gathered, he'd be right smack in the middle of it. 